All right, so it's about time we'll get started here. Uh, a couple people on and we're going to have uh, this recorded. I think I hear somebody right now. I think we're good. Anyway, we're going to have this recorded and uh, on the website for future learning for uh, not only primary care physicians uh, or the other orthopedic surgeons interested in this, but also patients. I think there's going to be some uh, knowledge that might be redundant to uh, some orthopedic surgeons, but hopefully it's helpful to many people out there who are not familiar with this procedure. Uh, this is going to be sponsored by uh, Houston Clinic in our Healthy Living series. And if you have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time, and uh, we'll have the contact information listed later. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, I am Dr. Lucas Ritchie. I am a board-certified orthopedic surgeon, also with fellowship training in sports medicine. Uh, I have been practiced here in uh, the Nashville area for just over seven years, I believe. And since my time in Nashville started, I have been uh, uh, working with the, uh, the striker team and the uh, Mako robotic assisted knee replacement. And I will be telling you why I made this switch and uh, also explaining it in a few moments. Uh, give me one second here. I have a primary care physician texting me asking me for a Zoom link. Melissa, are you gonna be able to handle that please? I'm sending it to Alyssa right now. All right, back on track. I apologize for that already. So resuming, uh, and we will open this up to questions at the end, but certainly if anybody has anything throughout this, you are welcome to, uh, to chime in and ask any questions as we go. They're very informal here, uh, but just want to focus on the educational aspects. Uh, first and foremost, I have nothing to, uh, to close, uh, no financial relationships with uh, the striker company or Mako or anybody else that we'll be talking about with tonight. Uh, busy slide, talks a little bit about myself. I'm actually from Ohio. My family still resides in Dayton, Ohio. Undergraduate at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Medical school in Cincinnati. Residency uh, and uh, internship. I was at Michigan State University and Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, fellowship, I was able to return back to Cincinnati where I was able to be a part of the Cincinnati Reds baseball team specializing in sports medicine. And currently I am a partner with Houston Clinic Orthopedics. I'm primarily based out of our Lebanon location, but I also served as the team physician for Mount Juliet High School and CrossFit Baseball out of Gallatin, Tennessee. So just talking about arthritis, it's a very drop in the bucket term. I have a lot of patients come into me and say, my doctor told me I had arthritis. Uh, and that's great that they have a diagnosis, but in actuality, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, the meaning of the word arthritis itself simply means swelling and inflammation of the joint. So oftentimes people will come in and say, I've got arthritis and they've got normal looking x-rays and they say, well, what are you talking about? Somebody said I have arthritis. Well, you might have an angry joint, but you may not have the typical wear and tear type pattern that we associate with osteoarthritis, which is most, what most of us refer to arthritis as. Now, arthritis, there are many, many different types. So here are some are listed, post-traumatic, meaning after an injury or fracture, uh, osteoarthritis, normal wear and tear, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic, gouty, and there are many, many others. For the purpose of this discussion, we're gonna focus mostly on osteo or wear and tear type arthritis. So when people come in with arthritis, uh, you can have a, a myriad of different symptoms. There's not one symptom that defines arthritis and everybody tends to present differently because pain itself is subjective. It can matter where the pain is, where the arthritis is, uh, as well as the timing and frequency. I would say the most common symptom that I hear patients complain about is stiffness after periods of rest, where if I specifically ask, what about your first step out of bed in the morning? They'll say, oh, doc, that is just the worst. It's, it's just like something creaking and cracking in there. And then you take 30, 40 steps and you feel pretty good until you sit down for breakfast and it's like starting all over again. Same thing after a long car ride, getting out of your truck, it just feels stiff as can be and then slowly loosens up. But other common symptoms are just a generalized aching, uh, swelling all around the knee, You'll hear fluid on the knee all the time. Loss of motion can happen progressively. And people also uh, complain of uh, grinding or even uh, leg alignment changes. Will those notice that their knees are starting to get more bowed um, or more of a knock knee appearance? So if we look at these x-rays, this is uh, kind of my bread and butter in that we tend to get weight bearing x-rays in our body because when you're laying down, you're not putting weight through the knees. We don't see the true wear pattern. 
So on the left, you see here, so this is the femur here on the left, tibia here on the right, and you see the space, okay? Now in the body, there's nothing floating. So something occupies that space. So the presence of space to me indicates there's something good filling that. And that would be the presence of healthy cartilage and healthy meniscus. So space is what you wanna see here. And that's a fantastic, normal looking x-ray. The other thing we see about this is the axis is straight down. Now let's look over here, for example. So this would be the right knee in this patient. Or actually we'll do left to left over here. And again, first thing I see is you have some space over here, but you are literally bone on bone arthritis there. That is wear and tear. And if this left x-ray is straight, all of a sudden we're seeing this one is getting a little bow-legged. The reason for that is most Americans will actually preferentially wear out the inside of their knee faster than the outside. And that more weight is going through this inside than it does through the outside. And so the outside, although it has some space, it's not entirely normal. And I see some bone spurs here and here as well. So this is something I would call a, a typical wear pattern, an osteoarthritic pattern, or if we want to get technical, the term for this type of knee is a varus knee. Uh, and that's an orthopedic terminology that uh, is probably not going to apply to most of our audience here. So keep in mind, we've lost the space, bone on bone, causing pain, and also the alignment change is a problem. And we'll talk about what we do with that later. So what do we do? Well, the first time you meet me, uh, it's probably not going to be surgery. Um, that's just not how my job works. And I think it's maybe a misconception or even a misnomer is that oftentimes people show up to see the orthopedic surgeon saying, oh my gosh, this guy's going to tell me I need surgery. Uh, that's not really my job. Yes, my job is to do the surgery and do it well when the time comes. But the decision for surgery, particularly in this topic of osteoarthritis, is very subjective. It's when the patient wishes to proceed forth with it. So anytime you come to see me, yes, I am the orthopedic surgeon. But more than that, I'm the musculoskeletal expert, and that I'm going to know more about this knee than most people. And we're going to go over all the different options. So you start small. When we look at all the things we can do for arthritis, we start easy. Exercise and weight loss, by far the most effective things we can do, and that we recommend low-impact, high aerobic activity, uh, bicycling, treadmill, yoga, water aerobics, all fantastic type activities. Uh, and as Dr. Burleson said in one of his uh, uh, recent videos, Motion is lotion, and really, it goes back to that, peop that uh, complaint of people saying stiffness after rest. Well, if it feels better when you're moving, we keep moving. Uh, weight loss, we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, also, anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This is the mainstay of treatment that have proven time and time again how effective they can be at helping with the symptoms of arthritis. Now, nothing on this page is going to undo or reverse the arthritis. All they're doing is temporizing the potential need for a later replacement. We're trying to get you by as comfortable as you can until you are mentally and physically ready to proceed forth with the surgery. Anti-inflammatories work well, and I have patients that take them for years at a time very safely without significant addictive potential or side effects. We've all heard the term cortisone, which is kind of a generic term for a steroid injection that we can put right into the knee. Many people get great relief from this but the timing or how long it's going to work is a little bit unknown. Some people get a day, if that. Some people get much, much longer. I had one person come in here tell me they got 10 years of relief out of it. I couldn't believe it, but good for them. Uh, beyond that, there's something called visco supplementation or the gel shots or the rooster comb, sh comb shots. Uh, it's basically a synthetic lubricant that our body's natural lubricating uh, oil in the knee is called hyaluronic acid. Some very smart scientists have figured out a way to make this in a lab that we can then inject, kind of give you a quick oil change, and it can buy a certain percentage of people uh, very good relief for long periods of time. And that's something we'll often try after the steroid injections stop working. Uh, bracing uh, can help some people, particularly something called an unloader brace, where we talked about that varus or bent or uh, knock kneed appearance. Uh, or it's going to be bow-legged appearance, that can actually kind of push the leg into a more neutral alignment and help to redistribute the weight down both sides of the knee uh, and help with some symptoms. And beyond that, we can talk about the platelet-rich plasma or the stem cells, which are a great treatment. Orthobiologics are the future of orthopedics. They have a great role in my practice, uh, but I could talk your ear off about that for hours, and that's not really the point of today's uh, lecture. But uh, again, a very good non-operative uh, treatment option we have there. 
So we talked about, or I alluded to weight loss in the previous slide, and this is just a little example of, of why we say that. And it's always a very difficult conversation to have because you never want the patient to feel like yeah, you're picking on them. Uh, but weight is a difficult problem we have, particularly in America these days. Uh, and second to that, it's hard to exercise if your knees hurt every step you take. So when we talk about weight loss, first thing is every step you take can multiply your body weight through your knee four to five times. So let, I got a scenario but down below. Let's say we have a 200 pound person with knee osteoarthritis, OA. And let's say they get their recommended 10,000 steps a day. Good for them. If that person were to lose 10 pounds, just 10 pounds, 10 pounds times five pounds every step they take times 10,000 steps a day, they've now taken a half a million pounds off their knee every single day. Uh, so like we, like we said, this is just a, a huge potential and that's why we're always recommending weight loss. Yes, it's good for overall health. Uh, and yes, it helps to decrease complications of knee replacement. But before we get to the knee replacement surgery, this alone can take a significant amount of weight and pressure and pain off of your knee. So then we start talking about the operative interventions and that's kind of why we're here tonight. Uh, the timing of replacement is something I always want to harp on. And I always tell patients, you treat the person, not the x-ray. You can have the world's worst bone on bone x-ray, but if you just say, hey, it's, it, I can do what I need to do and I'm living with it, then live with it. I will never tell you, you have to have this done based on how bad your x-ray looks. It, it, it's a very subjective thing. And we do it when we've exhausted all other measures and you're quite honestly just tired of living with it. And that's how people coming in for knee replacement surgery often present. They say, like, doc, I've done the anti-inflammatories. This is my weight. I'm working out. I'm walking. I'm tired of these medicines. I can't live like this anymore. It's time. And I say, great, let's, let's, let's talk. Uh, talk about knee scope here. Uh, knee scope in, in my practice is not indicated for a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. The old days of a clean out procedure, uh, I think, do not work. Uh, the studies have proven that. If you've got a, a mechanical symptom like a meniscus, maybe it buys you some time. But essentially, what I tell everybody is uh, a knee scope cannot treat arthritis, and that going into a knee scope with arthritis, you're coming out with arthritis. Uh, that let's say you have a meniscus tear. Review on some anatomy stuff first, and then. Hello? somebody's not muted, that's all right. Uh, and that going into a knee scope with arthritis, you're coming out. So theoretically, if 50% of your pain is meniscus and 50% is arthritis, the best I'm gonna do is you're gonna come out with 50% of your pain gone. So again, that's not the, the topic of tonight. Uh, partial knee is a, one of my partners gonna speak on later and we're gonna talk about the total knee replacement and how the robotic assisted total knee works. So this is a few pictures of what the robotic assisted knee surgery is. Uh, you see on the left, that is the actual robot. Uh, that's the arm uh, with multiple joints that helps us to make very precise, very reproducible, and very well-planned out cuts. Uh, here on the right, first of all, you see the space suit, kind of goofy, but we all wear it. Uh, it helps decrease the uh, uh, risk of infection, keeps the patient safe throughout. These little arrays right here, we'll talk about later, but these little guys are what the robot is sensing in the room. The, the sensor is identifying these little spots and that way it can tell exactly where the, uh, the patient and the patient's knee are in the room so that we can make the, uh, the cuts that we're planning. So just to get a couple of, uh, get your attention here is some statistics here. There are over 30 million Americans currently suffering from osteoarthritis. Women are much more likely than their male counterparts to have it. And it is estimated by, two, uh, by 2040, one quarter of the US population, which can be about 78 million people, will have osteoarthritis. Uh, typically in the US, we're doing more than 600,000 total knees annually. Talking about robots and MAKO, everybody says, oh my gosh, it's the latest and greatest. And it is the latest and greatest. And it's new, newer, but it's not brand new. It is tried, it is tested, it has worked well for years. Uh, MAKO has been assist, uh, assisting surgeons for about 14 years. There are more than 145 peer-reviewed studies on it, and more than 300,000 MAKO procedures have been completed. Uh, Houston Clinic Orthopedics right here in Wilson County in the Nashville area. Um, in Wilson County, uh, we were formerly Premier Orthopedics, but we were the first ones to use robotic assisted knee replacement in the state of Tennessee, and that was done about 10 years ago, and uh, we, do them, we did them early, and we do them often. Uh, today alone, I did four robotic assisted knee replacements. Traditional knees, they were first done in 1968. And 
to understand where we're going, we need to know, understand where we've been. And so why have I shifted my practice? Why do I believe so much in this robotic assisted technology? Uh, first off, robotics now allows to get a CAT scan and make precise cuts based on patient's natural anatomy and it's planned out through the computer. The old school way of doing it doesn't do that. And it's worked well for many surgeons. It continues to work well for many surgeons. Uh, but there are limitations. Uh, so first off, the guides. All right, so if I look at this, this is a traditional knee replacement. And if you look at this middle picture right here, if this is the tibia, this is called a, uh, an extra medullary guide. This guide sits on the front of the leg and attaches. And you see it here, same thing. If we attach that guide and you literally, you align it with the spine or the bone in the front of the leg and you step to the back of the room and say, yep, she's straight. And that's where you want it to be. Now, I don't know if you guys can see my camera at all, but this is that guide. And the uh, great part about it, you know, see if you can actually see it, it clips onto a leg like this. And this is what we would cut through for, for years. And you put your fingers here and you say, okay, equal space, equal space. It's gotta be preserved joint. That's exactly our alignment. And people do this to this day and they do great with it. In my eyes, it's just not as precise or as accurate as we can be with uh, the robotic assisted. And so that's kind of changed my practice a little bit. And I, I just like the objective values I'm able to achieve and the precision I'm able to achieve with the robot instead. Now that's an extra medullary guide. So if that weren't to work, you can do an intramedullary guide where you take a rod and you put the rod inside the bone. Well, there's a study for Journal of Arthroplasty in 1997 that showed the position where a lot of surgeons start their rod right in the middle of the knee. It's actually about six millimeters away. And the study went on to say that a simple rod placement error of millimeters can result in excess valgus or essentially a malalignment of your total knee arthroplasty. Malalignment of a knee replacement is a reason that knees can fail later on in life. Also, if you remember our previous x-ray of our knee, that x-ray captured from here to here. And again, from here to here. So we take x-rays of the knee and say, yeah, you got arthritis, let's do it. Let's put a rod up that femur to base our guide. This person had an old fracture that healed inappropriately. So if I slide my rod right up here, you come right out the side, don't even know that you're not in the femur there. So again, there are limitations in the older technology. Experienced surgeons handle these limitations. They do great with them, but these are just some of the considerations that I've uh, come across on why I prefer the robotic assisted technology. Number two is these guides that I've just shown you base your knee replacement essentially on the way you should be aligned, on what the book says, on anatomic norms. And the simple fact is we're not all put together all the same. There's no way that my uh, four foot 11 wife and Shaquille O'Neal have the same knee alignment. And we can compensate with that in many ways, um, but how precise are we able to be with that? Number three, safety. Soft tissue and bone. Number one, uh, with the robotic assisted, we're able to cut precisely where we want to be within a half a millimeter, one degree of perfect, what we consider perfect first time every time. What we plan is what we cut. But the other benefit is with the robotic assisted, it has parameters that it won't let you cut anywhere outside of the plant area. And when I learned to do this on cadaver bone way back in the day, we took that saw and we tried to cut beyond there. We know that the artery and the nerve are just beyond the PCL. Let's see if we can get this arm go and, and, and get back there. And the robot shuts off. It won't let you do it. So in terms of safety, it helps protect your collateral ligaments. It helps protect your nerve vascular bundle posteriorly and other important soft tissues all around the knee. And then last is outcome. And we'll get to that down the line. This is an interesting slide. Uh, this is one of the, the things we don't see anymore with robotic assisted knee replacement. And this is not mine, this is something I found online. That when we make this cut for this component, you make it right like this. You put the femur on, you say, great, it's a good looking fit. Well, the problem here is this thing, is that you've left a notch, it's called notching. It's not an uncommon thing. I've seen it happen before um, and usually it's not a big deal. Essentially though, by leaving that notch, by digging into the femur where the implant fits, this knee functions great until the stress riser kicks in, and then you can get this big fracture here, which is a much, much bigger ordeal. So again, going back to safety, with the robotic assisted, we don't notch anymore. And we can dial that in preoperatively, so we know exactly where we're cutting and coming out and touching the bone. 
So when somebody comes to my office and they want to talk about a makoplasty or robotic assisted knee replacement, first off, simple office visits, introductions, examination, see what we're doing, see where we're going with it, see what we've done conservatively, and if it's truly time for a knee replacement. I always get weight-bearing x-rays. Uh, very often people come in with x-rays, but if they're not weight-bearing, we are going to uh, reorder them because we want to make sure that we get to the true uh, pictures on where the weight is being distributed through the knees when you're standing on them. And then all that's gone, done, said and done. Let's say people say, okay, let's time, let's do a, a knee replacement. Well, the thing that's different about a Mako is we have to know your alignment because we're basing this knee replacement and building one specifically for the patient. So we get a CAT scan of the patient's entire leg from hip to ankle. And that tells us the anatomic as well as the mechanical axis of where all the weight goes through their leg and where it should go through their leg. It also gives us a 3D representation of the patient's knee. So before we even get in there and make cuts, I know what their knee looks like. I know the shape. I know where the bone spurs are. Uh, I know where the good bone is. And then we start planning our cuts before we've made a simple incision. What the robot uh, helps us do is then make our cuts within a half a millimeter and one degree of our planned alignment. So these are our planned cuts here. So this is uh, after you get your CAT scan, we're in the room. No incision has been made, but I'm looking at the computer screen. First off, no notching, okay? That femur is resting directly on, uh, the femoral components resting directly on the femur. And we can see this fits just absolutely perfectly. We have planned that we have two degrees of flexion in our femoral cut. We have three degrees, degrees of posterior slope, and we can change these parameters however we feel uh, appropriate, not only for the patient's own anatomy, but also for the implants we're putting in. We can dial in the rotation as well as correct the varus and valgus. And then based on this, I know that I'm gonna be cutting eight millimeters of bone off the here. I'm gonna be cutting 2.5 millimeters of bone off of here, so on and so forth. The other thing that you can really see is implant size now. Again, we're not notching up here, we also see on this tibia that it just fits perfect all the way around, right where we want it to be. So uh, it's again, building a knee replacement made specifically for each individual patient. So here's a little animation and I'm just gonna have to link you to a website real quick, but it should come up. And this is that planning procedure. There's a lot of great information on the Straker uh, Mako website. All right, so this is the planning, the CT-based planning. So as we said before, we've got everything here. Now that what we're doing with this button is we're actually changing the implant position. We're dialing this in to be exactly where we want it. Uh, and change, we can change each and every one of these parameters throughout the case. And up here on the right, we're changing the size of the components to make them fit. Now we subtract the bone and we're looking at CAT scans to make sure they fit just precisely right on the bone, that everything fits exactly where it is. And so we're just ensuring that we have the best fit as well as all of our angles and our implant position are gonna be as close to a perfect fit as we think we can achieve uh, with knee replacement surgery. All right. So after that, we're in the OR, we've got our plan on the computer. Now. The robot knows what it wants to do, but the robot doesn't know where the patient is in the room. So we hook up those arrays on the patient's leg, and then I make my incision. I'm looking at the knee. Again, the robot is helping me, but I do the surgery. There's not a robot doing it. I'm not having a coffee watching Sports Center. Uh, I'm actively involved. The robot is simply a tool in my bag. Now we need to register your knee. We need the robot to recognize where this knee is in space. So what I do these little bubbles, I pop these bubbles. I touch this knee in a hundred different places all over and I'm touching it with a probe over and over. And essentially we build a 3D model that that robot, the robotic arm is now sensing that says, okay, I, I understand the anatomy. I know where the knee is in space and we're ready to cut. After that, we do some ligament balancing that I take that, that angled or that varus knee or valgus if it calls for it and I stress it. I push on it and see if I can achieve a neutral alignment. And what we're doing there is we're tensioning the native ligaments to see what soft tissues we have that are functional so that we can make our bone cuts to make as much correction as possible and strip a lot less soft tissue than maybe traditionally required. One more video. This one's a little more fun. All right, so now that we've got our plan, we've registered our points, we know what we wanna do. 
this is how we cut, that I am looking in the knee, as you'll see on the bottom right here, but I'm also looking at the computer screen up on the left to make sure that I'm cutting everything. Now this green box around it is the parameters. We are not allowed to cut outside. The robot will shut off and that's protecting everything deep, all the PC, all the, uh, excuse me, the neurovascular structures. The green is the bone that has to go. So on the bottom right, you see I'm cutting the bone, but I'm only cutting where the robot and I have pre-planned to cut. And so I'm looking at the patient's bone, but everything's safely protected. And I'm cutting off the green sections there uh, to get rid of the bone that we don't need. So it's gonna be ready to adapt and to take on the knee replacement that we're gonna put in very shortly. Uh, we've got a series of cuts that we essentially will make a box out of. Uh, and I'll wait till we're done watching this video because it's much more exciting than my model. And then after we're done with all these cuts, and again, very controlled cuts, It says the videos are not showing up on our screen. I am so sorry. Thank you, Alyssa, for letting me know that. Hmm. Try this. Can anybody see a video? All right, good, we're up now. So again, I'm sorry, this green box here are the parameters. That's our predetermined area that's gonna protect everything else. We've got collaterals on the side, neurovascular bundles in the back. That is protecting us, so we can't cut anywhere else. Now with the saw, I'm looking at the bone, I'm cutting the bone with the saw here actually in my hand, but we're only cutting the green areas, what's being predetermined and pre-planned by myself and our engineers to get this thing cut perfectly or as close to it as we can to accept the new knee replacement. And so we make a series of cut, top, bottom, front, back, and we shape this knee the way we need to. All right, make all these fancy cuts. And then we cut the tibia, which is the lower bone. Uh, same thing, we cut this bone, cut all the green off, and then we remove all these cuts and we essentially have blocks. I'll get out of this. Let's see if I can connect our screen back where we need to be. Huge lag now. Okay, screen share. Back here. All right. Resuming slideshow. All right, can you see the slideshow again? I hope so. All right, so we talked about those cuts. Now the robot and this, we are planning, Alyssa, thank you. This is important, ignore the, the goofy face in the background here. But if you look at this picture here, where I've circled, I plan to cut 8.5 millimeters off of the lateral proximal tibia. So this is me holding the tibia here. And you may not be able to see the guide here, but I assure you zooming in, it shows that we've cut 8.5 millimeters of bone off. So we've cut exactly what we dialed in. And that's the power of the robot. We're cutting exactly what we wanna cut, where we wanna cut to give you this nice, perfectly aligned box that's going to be able to accept our new knee replacement. So let's talk about the procedure itself aside from the surgery. So uh, during the surgery, you have a choice of anesthesia. Uh, most of my patients, the vast majority are now getting a spinal anesthesia where they're getting sedation, they don't remember or feel anything, completely numb from the waist down. But without a general anesthesia, there's less risk, as well as not needing a tube down your throat, as well as not needing the general anesthesia, that there's a little bit less hangover. So people wake up a little bit happier, uh, feeling a little bit better, and it helps us to get them out of bed as soon as possible. Uh, I did four of these today. Three of them are already at home. And the last one may be leaving tonight, but about 80% of my patients are now going home the same day of surgery. Uh, the implants that we put in, uh, which I've got a model here again, we take these implants, put them inside or on top of the bone. And essentially we cement them in or glue them in, something called bone cement. And that bone cement is as hard as it's ever gonna be before the patient wakes up in the operating room. So we want early motion, we want early weight bearing. I want people walking on these immediately. And that my patients today, when they got to their room, they saw therapy, they walk up and down the hall, 
They make them walk up and down a stair. They have a, a, a car simulator that they help people get in and out of the car and prove that they're gonna be safe to go home. Typically, most of my patients use a walker about two to four weeks and then a cane about another two to four weeks. Uh, we start therapy as soon as possible, uh, as soon as hours after surgery, and we usually continue that for a few months afterwards. So in my eyes, what are the benefits? Well, it's more precise. It's more reproducible. I'm cutting where I want to, uh, and we can reproduce that cut all day long. Typically, it is a quicker procedure uh, in my hands, and that's just experience. When we talk about the guides, the extramedullary and the intramedullary guides, it's um, it's something I don't do as often, so I'm not going to be as fast as it. Uh, but oftentimes, I'll, I'll line it up and say, okay, it's good, and I'll go to balance, and it's not quite perfectly balanced, so it requires a little bit more back-end work to, uh, to make it as functional as it needs to be. Uh, whereas the, the robotic assisted my hands, uh, we did four of these a day. I think every one of them was under an hour tourniquet time, so we're, we're making progress in it. Uh, but it, it does, uh, uh, it, it makes it so that I very rarely, I maybe once or twice in the last seven years, have to go back and make a second round of cuts because our pre-planned cuts are exactly where we want them to be. Uh, this is quickly becoming an outpatient procedure. And amidst the COVID, I think it's a good thing. Uh, we can get our patients who are hurt, not sick, out of the hospitals, keep them healthy, but also keep available resources ready for anybody uh, who, who may be affected with this pandemic and be required to be at the hospital. Not to mention, uh, you know, I'd wanna recover in my own house and sleep in my own bed as quickly as possible too, once it's safe. And then the last point here is less soft tissue surgery. I always learned that a knee replacement is a soft tissue procedure, and it still is. Yes, we're making bone cuts. Yes, we're using saws and hammers. But the balancing, how to get it that it's equal tension on both sides and it's going to be a functional knee depends on the soft tissue envelope around it. So I tell everybody that everybody's going to get the bone cuts. Okay, We have to cut the bone to get the new metal and the new replacement in there. With the old way, you put the metal in there, and then you have to certainly start stripping off soft tissues to balance the knee. Well, now I can stress those soft tissues, and we can make a majority of our correction through the bone cuts. Everybody's getting the bone cuts, but now I can make more and greater correction through the bones and less soft tissue stripping. The patients often have a little bit less pain afterwards. So as we talk about those bone cuts, excuse the blood, uh, you see on the left is an arthritic knee. We've got bone on bone here. We've got some good cartilage over here, decent at least, but it's not fully exposed. After we use the robot to make these cuts, we've got this perfect box that's gonna accept the new knee and we see a perfect spacing here to here that we would consider this balanced. So talk about a couple of things here. Uh, a couple of uh, presentations here uh, showed that in the lab, the uh, Mako assisted knee enables surgeons to execute their surgical plans much more accurately. I think that's pretty easy to understand. We have a lot more reference points with this. Um, from the Journal of Arthroplasty of 2018, they're they stated in clinical studies, Mako protected soft tissue and ligaments from damage. Okay, just what we talked about. The Journal of Knee Surgery of 2017, in a clinical study, a Mako patients uh, surveyed six months after surgery reported lower pain scores than those who received a conventional knee replacement. Uh, also, those patients surveyed six months after surgery reported better pain, patient satisfaction scores compared to those who received a conventional joint replacement. Uh, from the jo Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, uh, July of 2018, this was a prospective consecutive series with a single surgeon comparing uh, patients undergoing a conventional jig-based knee replacement versus the robotic-assisted MAKO. I concluded that the MAKO knees with the triathlon, which is the type of knee that I put in, was associated with less post-operative narcotics, analgesics and pain meds, uh, less time to hospital discharge, less need for inpatient physical therapy sessions, and less post-operative pain. Those are four big wins. Uh, Dr. Haddad, uh, Journal of Arthroplasty 2018, again, performed a prospective clinical series. Uh, and they said that a MAKO versus traditional concluded that a MAKO total knee with the striker triathlon knee that I use was associated with less bone and soft tissue damage. So again, getting back to the safety and the plan portion. Now, if we look at a uh, presentation from the Orthopedic Research Society uh, stating, uh, do total knee uh, orthoplasty surgical instruments influence clinical outcomes? And the conclusion was that compared to computer navigated total knees, patients who received robotic assisted total knees had significantly improved 
post-op pain, less morphine consumption, and a reduced length of hospital stay. Presented at the Knee Society in 2018, a multi-center analysis of outcomes on the robotic assisted knee. The data indicates that a robotic assisted knee replacement patients had greater improvement in their functional activity walking and standing scores at both four and six to six weeks and six months. So we've got short-term and long-term benefits in the robotic assisted knee versus the conventional knee alone. Uh, additionally, the robotic assisted patients had a higher overall functional activity improvements at one year follow-up, so an even longer long-term follow-up. Journal of Knee Surgery 2017, patient satisfaction outcomes after a total knee, uh, robotic assisted total knee, uh, is that a single surgeon study of 28 robotic assisted had a significantly lower pain score and greater patient satisfaction than manual total knees. The results uh, from this study showed that patients who underwent a robotic assisted total knee demonstrated better overall patient satisfaction and functional outcome scores. So we've got a lot of these over and over. This last one hits a little bit differently. And this one actually showed that robotic assisted total knees had overall lower average 90 day episode of care cost to the payer, which was Medicare in this, compared to conventional. The cost savings were driven by a reduced index facility costs. Uh, lower narcotic use might be one of those, lower length of stay, uh, discharge destinations were home as opposed to rehabilitation centers, and decreased readmissions. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about a, a case here, and then we'll open up for any discussions here. It's an interesting case. It was used with the permission of the patient. We actually spoke with her today. She's doing well, and she's very happy. Uh, this is a 68-year-old female with chronic knee pain. Uh, as we can see here, she's got a little deformity here. She's got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis osteophytes, bone spurs here and here, just a typical arthritic knee. Well, preoperative CAT, CAT scan shows something different. And she's got this mass, okay, right here. It's stuck on a distal femur. It's a benign mass. It was ruled out. It was just a mass. But essentially what it's done is it's pushed her kneecap way to the side. And uh, her kneecap has not functioned appropriately or uh, anatomically in who knows how long. We've also got the traditional bone on bone changes, but the CAT scan itself has already proven that we've got everything we need to know, that we've got her anatomy, we know where to go, especially in this difficult case with very abnormal anatomy. So inside surgery, what we're looking at here is I've got the knee opened up. This is the kneecap, this is the patella. Don't do that, don't, oh, it's gonna reset. This is the, uh, the mass over here. See if I can escape out of that. One second, sorry about that. All right, so we've got bone on bone. You see exposed bone down here, bone on bone, really about as bad as you get on kneecap. And then we've got this mass here. So her normal anatomy is very distorted. Well, using the power of the robot, we can tell exactly what we want to do. That we've turned this knee into this knee. Nice smooth metal, mass is gone a very functional knee and the kneecap now tracks right down the middle of that knee. So we see her before, or excuse me, her after as compared to her befores, it's uh, very telling that before bone on bone, after we've got equal spacing here and here, we've got a straight anatomic alignment. And then the lateral view, we've finally got that kneecap tracking right in the middle, which she hasn't done in who knows how long compared to this pretty bad beat up looking knee over there. This is a slide I included. I don't have his pre-op x-rays, uh, but this uh, was somebody who had had a ACL reconstruction done a long time ago. And traditionally with the knee replacement, you hope you don't hit the metal, you don't know, but these are metallic screws in here. And so you, with the traditional guides, you put it in, you hope you don't hit the metal, but if you have to, you go dig in, you take it out and you leave them with holes in the bone. It's not the end of the world. We've all done it. We'll, we'll continue to have to do it sometimes. But the power of the Mako here, you can see it. we were able to dial in before that I knew I was gonna miss this thing by about a millimeter. Same thing here. I missed this screw by about a millimeter. And we were able to plan our robotic assisted knee to use this patient's own anatomy without leaving him extra holes from taking out those implants and not causing any unnecessary un, un, uh, due trauma to his leg by removing things that really aren't in our way. They don't affect our outcome at all. So quick takeaways. What do we talk to the patient? So first and foremost, a Mako or a robotic assisted knee is making a robotic assisted, uh, or making a knee made just for you, just for the patient. It's not the anatomic norm. You're not gonna get the same knee as anybody else, but 
with the CAT scan and the technology we're using, we're making one that should be based on your anatomy. Uh, second of all, the robot is not doing your surgery. It is still the surgeon doing the surgery. The robot is a fantastic tool that I have to help me do a more accurate, more precise, and more reproducible surgery. It only takes a few three degrees of malalignment to increase failure rate among knees. And so the old ways with the, the guides, we get it pretty close. We like it, but uh, who knows how far the eyeball can take us. Uh, there are a lot of people that do a great job with total knees. But again, with the, the robotic assistant or the MAKO, we can dial in the amount of degrees that we want it to be and get you as close to what we consider uh, uh, acceptable or appropriate alignment. Uh, the next point is the bone cuts. Everybody's getting the bone cuts. Why not just to make the most out of them? With the MAKO, we can get the bone cuts where we need it to be, uh, as opposed to doing more soft tissue balancing. Uh, this is currently becoming more and more of an, out, out, excuse me, an outpatient procedure. As I said, 80 plus percent of my patients are typically going home the same day. And practice what you preach. Uh, we've had the Mako down here in Tennessee for I believe about 10 years. Uh, I make my own father and my aunt drive from Dayton, Ohio, five and a half hours to get their knees done down here on the robot. Both of them had them done in the morning and both of them were back home playing with my kids uh, that afternoon. So uh, I believe wholeheartedly in it that I trust my own family with this technology. Now it's a big fancy toy, it's very expensive. It's a great tool, but not every place has it. Where can we get it done? We're blessed that in uh, the Middle Tennessee area, we've got several options. I do my Mako assisted robotic knee replacements uh, done in Lebanon, Tennessee at Vanderbilt Wilson County Hospital, at TriStar Summit in Hermitage, and TriStar Centennial uh, Medical Center in Nashville. Those are the locations where I have credentials to get this done and uh, we, we do fairly well with it. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna stop talking. If there's any questions, great. If not, uh, please feel free to contact me. All right. Thank you, everybody.